Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. Yeah, what are we doing? I don't know what we're doing. Somebody tell me. <laughs> no, we're, uh, I, I, this is kind of cool. We're here with our friends, Justin and Kira from West by 1000. Contributors, longtime friends of Overland Journal. These guys kind of go everywhere on two wheels. And um, I think one of the things that we like so much about it is they actually kind of do it in an attainable way, which is really rad. They're not on the fanciest bikes. They're not on the biggest bikes. They kind of just get after it. They're always out exploring. So it's a really great thing to have you guys on. Thanks Thank for coming you. up. We yeah. really appreciate being invited. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And from my perspective, the quality of the content that you guys produce is world class. You guys have done several things for the magazine. Justin, your photography is totally enviable. The quality of work that you're doing. Matt and I were just talking earlier today and some of your action sport stuff is is truly exceptional, world class right now. So you should be really proud of the, Thank you. the work you're doing. And another thing that's always been so aspiring to me is the fact that you guys have been able to kind of just take your own path. You've never just stuck yourself on like the influencer train or anything else you've done what felt creatively inspiring to yourselves and allowed you guys to travel together and, and have all these amazing new experiences. So it seems like you've put those things first. So maybe talk about that a little bit. How do you guys make decisions about what you're going to do next? And a special thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, Off the Grid Surplus. They recently sent Matt and I a few pairs of their new Trailblazer Pro pants, uh, which I think are ideal for international travel, remote exploration, and of course, overlanding. Personally, I like the overall fit of these pants. They are tailored well. They don't look like you've got a tent wrapped around your waist. And they have four-way stretch as well. They have eight pockets scattered around the waist and the upper thigh. And they even have a mag pocket if you're feeling extra tactical sometimes days or you need a spot to store a handheld radio or a multi-tool. They are quick drying, which I think is really important for international travel. That way you can wash them in the sink of the hostel and have them dry by the next morning to continue on with your journey. It allows you to pack much lighter when you don't have to worry about doing laundry all the time. They are also very lightweight and water resistant, which I think is both an advantage for mixed conditions and unknown weather. In fact, I think that I've been wearing them so much that my other pants are starting to get jealous. And if you'd like to have your very own pair, for the next 30 days, they are offering a 10% off program if you use the code Overland Journal. Thanks again, Off the Grid Surplus. Oh, man. Or is it just a complete madhouse and you're going to give us some Yeah, a lot of, I mean, a I lot mean, of it is 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 sort of not saying no to things. Like yeah, when opportunities, when people come to us with an opportunity, we, we're oh, unless there's a schedule conflict, we usually always say yes. Yeah. yeah. As long as that sounds cool. Well, and if it's <laughs> on that, like the long list of things we've wanted to see or do, sort of thing that's like okay we have a free few months this is the right weather or the right time to go to italy or or go to mongolia or, or something i mean you guys are such nomads you're kind of everywhere always yeah, it's been seven seven years i think yeah. yeah since we've been we've been pretty much on the road for like seven years i mean we Homeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have, you know, our, you know, our things in one place now. Finally, we had a garage. That was it. I remember yeah. the garage. Yeah. Yes. It was a garage filled with moto gear. Yeah. It was a really cool garage. It's yeah. basically we got rid still of that the- garage and then we bought uh, garage doors for his mom's house and she lets us store our crap there. Yeah. <laughs> now. It, was a, it was a pretty good trade. It's much cheaper. Yeah. It was a pretty good trade instead of having a, like a storage garage full of junk. But- so you guys bounce between Phoenix yeah. and then spend most of your time kind of these days in Ensenada, which is cool. I mean, what, what do you guys like so much about Ensenada? I mean, I, I love Baja. We all love Baja. Yeah. 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 I think everybody loves Baja. It's not scary. You should it go. It's definitely yes. not scary. It, I mean, culturally, it's extremely developed and it's diverse. And people, I mean, if you want to meet passionate entrepreneurs and artists, there's a lot of them down there. Obviously, we have friends and we have kind of a homestead to go back to. So it's really easy for us. But there's just so much on a personal level with nature, with the people, the Good. language berries not too hard like good food have yeah. you guys picked up a little bit of spanish she speaks way I more try. spanish than i do I, I, i'm terrible at I it stumble through. I, I can understand it a lot better than i can she can speak it well the problem is that it. everyone in ensenada speaks well not just ensenada baja they speak english and then they also you know don't have time for you to fumble through your <laughs> Spanish. I, can yeah, i they, swear <laughs> just, we'll, we'll take care of okay. it don't worry about it <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Subpar they, Spanish. M- most people down there, you know, most people in Baja want to practice their English as much as you want to practice Interesting. Spanish. And sure. so you kind of bump into that a lot. Like yeah. they're, they're, I mean, they're, yeah, it's, but, I mean, they're, you can get around fine. Everyone's really, they find it funny when you actually do try. And so they'll speak to you in English, so, or in Spanish, so you can practice understanding and they encourage you speak back to me in English. We can have like a little language trade. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's something that's like yeah, that's super high on my list when I actually have, well, I need to just make the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. You absolutely. know, there's so many wonderful Spanish speaking countries around the world that I really need to need to prioritize that. I mean, like you said, all of them typically when you're down there, yeah. they, they speak English. So it, maybe it's the courtesy I need to do back. Yeah, we have, we, we have good friends down there. That's another, I mean, we have a, a number of very good friends down there and that draws us back down when COVID, she was talking about this earlier, when COVID hit, we were in Sonora, the Sonora rally had just wrapped up and everybody was bailing and going back to the States. And we just turned and went West and yeah. went, went to Ensenada and we were there all the way through the end of June. Um, wow. Yeah. I think actually we made one trek up and then back down. Yeah. We went, I think we went yeah. up to grab some stuff and then turned around and went back to Ensenada and just stayed all the way through the end of June. And the place that we stay is called Granada Cove. It's a little, okay. little cove on the, on the, on the sea. And we called it Granada COVID and <laughs> because everybody was kind of stuck there. Like we, yeah. and we actually ran out of water Memorial day week and we Towards ran out of water for like two weeks. Interesting. The whole city of Ensenada. There was a fire at the water treatment plant north of town. Oh man. So yeah. for two weeks we had no water and we had, uh, Mauricio's got this hot tub. Which we, luckily we had filled because yeah. for years it was just empty. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and we were in it a lot. Well, we, <laughs> we had another friend of ours, Joel is traveling in a solar powered van and he had made it as far as central Baja and then broke long down. story broke down, came back to Ensenada and we were using the solar powered van to heat the hot tub. <laughs> and so we, during COVID, we were just hanging out in this hot yeah, tub. And then we run, we had a projector and we usually run movies off the van. So we parked the van in front of the hot tub. <laughs> it was a really tough time for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but we, when we ran out of water, we used the hot tub water for the toilets. And, and to take the neighbors showers. also would come and grab some because our friends Mauricio and Abby, they have a lot more than maybe some of the people around them. So they were pretty generous. Their resources. That's cool. That's why yeah. should. It seems that culture is very much that way. Yeah. 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 Um, the one, one of the few times I've hitchhiked in my life was in Mexico. And I just remember being so nervous being in a de- different country. One of my first trips, I was in the middle of Copper Canyon and got totally la- lost on a hiking trail and like just stuck my thumb out in the middle of Mexico. And of course, the people were totally wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. And some of them spoke English a little bit and they were like making sure that I was OK and like yeah. went out of their way. I mean, every experience just about that I've had in Mexico has just been so wonderful. Yeah. They're just it's a great culture down there. And I, I think that for me, one of the questions that a couple of the questions that I wanted to ask, but one comes to mind fairly early around the conversation that we just had with where you guys live and how you live your life. Uh, what has living that way taught you? How has that really changed your perspective as travelers, but also like as humans, since you have kind of stripped away a lot of the traditional ways of living, you, you don't go to a nine to five, you don't go to the same home, you don't drive the least sedan. Yeah, you guys have completely changed all of those things in your life and how has that really changed you how has that really affected you i mean you really nailed it with the the stripping away part especially for me i i've realized you don't need very much stuff you need way less stuff than you actually than you have currently and a lot less than you think you need i mean i i I travel with a backpack full of camera gear and a, and a duffel bag with clothes and that's it. Yeah. That's all, and that's all I need. If I'm riding a motorcycle, you can add, you know, a camping helmet and riding gear. gear and some camping yeah. stuff. And then, you know, you're pretty well set. I mean, I think stripping it away and, and realizing I mean, when we first started really traveling together, like on a permanent basis, we, we ended up living in Japan for a while and which we want to talk about later. Yeah. 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 That's, we'll get back to yeah. I mean, it, you know, traveling there and then just bouncing around to other places to work and do things. You have to keep it small and you know, you can't take Take all that stuff with you. So I mean, whatever you can carry, sort of thing. And if yeah. you don't want to carry a, a lot of weight, which I don't, so yeah. you just figure out how to wear the same. Pair I, of I think traveling on. keeps your mind busy, and it yeah. makes you realize that it's you know living in the moment is actually the most fulfilling thing you can do. I always, I don't know personally, I always kind of go between this thing of when I'm traveling, I'm like super happy, and I I don't know how else to say, but I forget about Amazon. I forget about that thing that I want. Yeah. I the forget about stuff. the. 
yeah. the upgrade that I want to do to my bike or my car or whatever. And I'm just like living in the moment. I think when you, when you're able to reach that point, you know, you realize I don't actually need that stuff. And you, oh, yeah. you appreciate quality more as well. Yeah. Like, ha- having good, I mean, if, if you're only going to have, a you know, few a few things, you're only going to have one duffel bag. Yeah. It better be you one that you, you like, and you're going to keep using it. And it's going to survive. Like that's a big, that's always, that's been a big part of our Yeah. That's our definitely lifestyle. been introduced to my lifestyle since yeah. we started traveling more. It's just uh, quality over quantity, not having to worry about the durability of my gear when I, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And like, I don't know, it's, it's nice on a mental level to just kind of strip that stuff away and uh, focus on people that you meet and the landscapes that you experience and kind of the tasks at hand. Yeah, it's just and, so much and, less stuff to worry about. Kira, how have you found that seven years of living like that has changed you as a person? How are you a different Kira today than seven years ago? I I mean, I'm definitely, I would say that, you know, the minimalism, obviously now that we have a little bit more of kind of a homestead in Arizona and Ensenada, I have more stuff than I had earlier on in the travels. Um, but I definitely am more thorough and thoughtful about my choices uh, in everything. And I care more about the relationships that I have. I don't have time for a lot of them, so they have to be really worthwhile. Uh, you know, just, and you guys as travelers also probably know, it's like, it's not easy to just maintain a thousand Facebook friendships and be really quality. Um, because I, I can hardly call my best friend from high school, you know, all the time. So, and then you're constantly meeting new people, Yeah, right? I think that's one of the the fun things of traveling, at least for me. And I think most travelers is those connections and those things that you meet on the road. And and I feel you with like the, the, the friends from high school, like, like I feel bad. Like I love, I love a lot of those people dearly when you're just constantly going and going and going it almost just continues to separate your life from that of a normal one yeah we have very and it makes it harder to, it makes it so it, hard to does, relate does that make it difficult to relate back to those older relationships because now they're maybe they are doing the more of the suburban path which is not a bad thing so, no no you know, no it, it's, it can be a beautiful thing in many ways too so are you finding that your your relationships are also changing because you need to relate more to the people that you're with yes i mean well when it comes to the very few people that I do keep in contact with from, you know, past life sort of thing. Yes, there's a a huge divide, I think, in what we do. But as long as you're genuinely interested in that person, it gives me, you know, my time to listen to them and get to know what their life is about and Mm. hear their their trials and tribulations. And if they want to hear about mine, they can hear about it, talk about it a lot because we're obscure. So people ask about it a lot. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I kind of get tired of talking about what I'm doing. So it's nice to actually hear what your friends are doing for like two hours. Hours. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, the the other side, right? The grass, yeah. on the other side. Yeah, my, my best. How about you? The grass is not greener on the other side. We have really good lives. <laughs> I know. Me. I love it. I'm not going to complain. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a lot of um, I don't have a lot of old friendships that I maintain. I my best friend is up in, in Seattle, and he's he's doing. He's doing very well, especially considering where we all came from and the lifestyle that he's living is pretty normal. You know, he's got a normal job. He's got a, he's got a lady, bought a house, yeah. no kids yet, but, um, but it's what he wanted. It was like, he reached his goals. And so, yeah. you know, he's happy with that. He actually came down and saw us oh. Memorial day weekend in Mexico. Yeah, we, we exactly. had to, we had to sneak him in to Ensenada because <laughs> they had the military had closed off the, the highway Sure. and uh, we went over the border, picked him up in San Diego, came back over the border, coming into Ensenada, they wouldn't let us in. And all of our stuff was there, you know, our car, everything. So we had to take some back roads to the sure. to the yeah. valley to get him in, but you know, but he's you know the, he's willing to do that. He's willing to jump on a plane, fly down to San Diego, and sneak into Mexico to hang out with me. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, we don't have anything in common in the general sense anymore. I mean, he yeah, you just care about each other. Yeah, stuff. I mean, yeah. he likes you know he likes fishing and barbecuing and watching football on Sunday, and that's but that's sometimes his, that's really nice. Yeah, oh I, I mean, I I talk about yeah. that all the time. I'd love to just like sit at home and eat a pack of Oreos and do nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think I think one of the interesting things with COVID is so many travel have been able to try out that normal nine to five life. Like I found yeah. myself like, Ooh, I, I want to watch football on Sunday. Yeah. That yeah. sounds, that sounds great. They have those, those triumphant horn music and it's really, it's like a, it's like an event, but um, oh man, like so true. You, you guys yeah, have been so able true. to kind of keep it going. Like, I feel like one of the things that I, that I really respect about you is you found a way to kind of ethically and sustainably still explore and live a life of adventure, I guess, during COVID. Yeah. I mean, you guys were just in Saudi Arabia yeah. for the Dakar rally. Yeah. And then last year you guys were in Peru. Peru for Dakar 2019. 2019. Yeah. End of 2019. Okay, so, yeah, exactly. so two years ago. Yeah. I always get Dakar confused because it starts like, 
January the, 1st. January 1st, yeah, and it'll yeah, be exactly. Dakar 2021 because it is 2021. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. my mind hasn't switched <laughs> years yet. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. us too, because we get there before the new year. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right, the new year, wherever we're at. So it's like yeah. This year we we flew out weird. on Christmas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. The, yeah. yeah. We flew yeah. out Christmas Day to Saudi. Well, and it was du- like a, we, we got quarantined in Dubai for a day, sort and then, of. It and then ended up. It wasn't really. Yeah, and then ended up in Riyadh for or Jeddah. Or for like 48 we had to, hours. Yeah, quarantine for two days in Jeddah. Yeah. Before and we like five, I think we took four COVID tests before we could even start the Dakar and then one on the way home. Yeah. Yeah, we took, yeah, like three COVID tests before getting on the flight from well, LA. Well, because we then... didn't get the results back. So we had we went to one, wouldn't get the results back in time. So we went to another one. They wouldn't get it back in time. So we went to another one, like a mile down yeah. the street from the Airport. LAX. Yeah. And then took a cab back and we had like 15 minutes before they wouldn't let us board. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we got really lucky. I mean, everybody getting getting to the Dakar is its It own. was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, the, a, the ASO makes, like, I'm, I'm convinced that they, they set that up. Like, they make everything difficult for you. Like, yeah. the entire process of getting to death. Well, the safer difficult. that they get as a whole, the more annoying that I have to make it. Because there has to be some challenge left. So they're like, okay, well, we have the safety regulations. So instead, we're going to make you walk, uh, walk two miles to go to the bathroom. And then another two miles to find food. And then not tell you how to navigate through things. Yeah, this, this year, the bivouac was a little more condensed than, like, in Peru. It was it was like a like a jungle. I mean, it would, you'd get lost. This year, they set it up the same every day, so you knew exactly where things were. It was oh, that's shit. smart. It was, that's yeah. clever. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they did that. Uh, it, I, I don't know why they regulate. hadn't done it before. I guess is a better question. What, what did you th- What did you think about that event? Now that you since you've done the event in South America, which the first time I went to the Dakar was in South America because it's different from when it was in Africa. In South America, almost everyone has a car. Yeah. So I thought I'm going to go check out the Dakar. So I get this. Defender 110 and I drive over from Santiago over the mountains and, and I'm trying to get to the Dakar. I could not even get close. Oh yeah. yeah. Like yeah. It, there were so many people, yeah. so many locals. If you were on a motorcycle, you'd be set, but yeah. in a car, forget, we couldn't get close. Traffic is crazy. So I turned around and I went to Mendoza and drank wine for two weeks. <laughs> so yeah, it, it turned out track. just fine. <laughs> well, and watched, the, fine. watched the Dakar from the helicopter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. No, when, when it was in Peru in 19, when we went, uh, there were like 300,000 people at the start. They I had mean, a, it was so packed that they were starting to have riots. Justin and I, at separate occasions, were almost we were getting caught into riots, mm. and like it was so packed, people would hold their babies over their heads so they wouldn't get crushed wow. by the crowd. Yeah, it was and completely. I the, I actually insanity. escaped all of that courtesy of Max Eddy and Robbie Gordon. Robbie Gordon came out of nowhere, and everybody was like moving out of the way to get a photo yeah, of him. And he and caught eyes with Justin. Yeah, he's like you want. And I was, he's like, you want to come with us? And I was like, <laughs> yes, yeah, please. help, get me out of here. Yeah. Wow. And everybody just it was like parting the Red Sea because everybody was backing up to try and get a photo of him and that was like being at a soccer match and yeah. everybody's trying to crush each other yeah and, it yeah. was nuts yeah. and then going from that to saudi is i mean it's crickets yeah i mean obviously there, covid's guys. going on but yeah they, there were hard, there was hardly anybody there am i the only one that thinks that sounds lovely it's not bad i mean <laughs> it was pretty it was nice really easy to walk around <laughs> although yeah. we, we went to the silkway rally in july of last of and that's in mongolia russia it starts russia. in russia it changes every year okay. also um it always starts in we russia there it was russia through mongolia to china okay it was last year was supposed to be their 10th anniversary so they were gonna do something like france to Mm. moscow to china to mongolia all this crazy route then maybe to a couple of the stands this year i'm not entirely sure what the route is but yeah we don't know yet they haven't announced the route so so you guys have done dakar in south america you've done dakar in saudi Saudi, obviously this year you've done silkway yeah you've done when you were the photographer for the baja rally for both of you for quite a while for sonora rally yep i mean that's we went to the sardinia rally that, that was, was how it was oh, i remember that i was yeah. so yeah. jealous yeah. i was like any any reason to go to sardinia is yeah. a good reason yeah, yeah. the place that was the last time I mean, you, you and i hung out yeah there. actually yeah. yeah the last time i was there was with you yeah, yeah. so That's jealous right. for the gootsie yeah the we were Gucci there for match? that tt85 yeah. watch while everybody else was doing whatever they were doing we grabbed like this three-cylinder <laughs> rental car and drove around it was perfect oh yeah it was great great yeah i went and found some ruins yeah that was awesome that's why like the small more intimate races i'm not gonna lie they're the way more fun mm. than going to the dakar dakar's just suffering but if you want to experience a rally like you go to the sardinia rally you go to morocco you do Greece. like go somewhere you want to experience the culture and yeah 
and take a vacation like, and then go. Dakar around. seems hard. Like Dakar seems hard as media oh, as yeah. you guys were there. Dakar seems hard on the cruise. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember watching uh that the the, the vlog series that Lyndon Poskett did. Oh, yeah. Where he was in the what was the name of the class? The Mali Moto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this dude's like has just ridden twelve or fourteen hours on a motorcycle at race pace and now he's sleeping next three feet from a generator. Yeah. And I'm like, nope, I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but Mali Moto is definitely the, the that's yeah. that's like They're proper the Dakar. That's that's real Dakar. Yeah. The, that's what the original Dakar was kind mm. of framed around. It's like what you can fit in this box. You're completely unsupported. You take care of yourself. Mm. But then it was in Africa. So yeah. in South America, I'm not going to say it was easier, but race friends of ours are like, eh, it's easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But it's still like, uh, and Back in Saudi, it's it's another new challenging terrain, and it's still very very hard. For the I'm, I'm amazed by the the variety of terrain that Saudi Arabia offers. I mean, I, I guess rather ignorantly, I've always thought KSA was desert. Sand, was sand was sand dunes. I yeah. thought it was. Yeah, it's what you saw. In, well, and in I mean, the empty Lawrence quarter, the, the southern half is. Just yeah, sand. yeah, yeah. But and then and then we have a mutual friend, Louis Ashelli. I know he's probably listening to this. I'm sorry if I butchered your your name, but um, <laughs> the stuff he posts so and the stuff that so you guys great. are posting I mean, it's like oh look here's moab but it's twice the size and there's no one there yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's i mean i've always heard that the middle east has some incredible untouched yeah. landscape and i've always been very curious yeah and uh, rightfully so because saudi had some of the most incredible diverse and just surprising landscape that you'd yeah. ever see and as a as a as a woman traveling there they've you know, I think it's worthwhile prefacing that I personally feel Saudi has made, you know, huge, huge steps in um, rights for women and uh, modernization and things. I mean, you have to take into the contest that they really are making a lot of progress. Yeah, um, comparatively. There's probably things that still aren't right by Western standards. It's a different culture. Well, we've yeah. talked about what we've, her and I have talked about this and numerous people, like you have to remember that this is a culture that's thousands of years old. Yeah. And they've, and been, they've been closed doing this, off yeah, they've been closed many off. years. Like they've So been, any, any step is a big step for yeah. them and, and the fact that they've the crown prince is he's got his project 2030 and he's trying to yeah. open the country up for tourism by 2030 and and treat it like another dubai another emirates you know yeah. yeah effectively and for whatever the government's faults are the people there are still open to new ideas mm. and interested and like they were extremely curious about us why we were there they were very supportive very giving i mean mm. their culture they're known for being great hosts yes um and so it's just it's something that if you don't go there and if you listen to what people people tell you, you won't get the chance to experience how good those people are yeah. Yeah. and how cool the culture is. I mean, and you know, uh, as a woman, I'm sure we'll get into it. It's just like, I was stressing over what I'm supposed to wear, what, how I'm supposed to act, especially my, you know, by myself. Cause he and I will be separated at first. I wore the abaya and I covered my hair and no one thought anything of it. And then slowly I just started to see where my limits were and I never really, I was never bothered. So Mm. no one seemed to care. They'd still, maybe it's because I was with a race team that they were maybe forgiving because they put like, for instance, their celebrities are in a different status. They might show up and without their hair covered in more scantily clad comparatively. But um, for me, I never felt like I was an outsider necessarily. Mm. People still talk to me. They still ask questions. They never looked me up and down as if I wasn't appropriate. I didn't feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. We met some, we met some very interesting people. Like I was in the middle of the desert, first or second stage, ran into a, a guy named Nasser. He's a little bit younger than me. And he was wondering what I was doing in the middle of the desert. And I equally so. I'm like, what, how are you out here? And he's uh, he's like a computer, you know, he works in IT in Riyadh. And we were on the opposite side of the country. And he had taken his two week vacation from work to go chase the Dakar around all of Saudi. And he'd awesome. never, he'd never seen most of his own country just, you Amazing. know, naturally. And, and so he, and he loves cars. So he's like, this is perfect. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're super they're car crazy. Cars. Yeah. Yes. Like he and I spent like two and a half, three hours in the desert together, just hanging out and talking me trying to get a better understanding of what being a 30 something is like in Riyadh. And he, we, you know, we start chatting 
chatting on social media and stuff throughout the race. He's sending me photos. He ended up coming back to Jeddah at the finish and meet us. He met us at our hotel and brought us like bags of dates and hung out and had oh, coffee. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Industry, like, right? yeah, that's amazing. He's really into RC cars and stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. And so are we. Right yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's a cool dude. He's like out of nowhere. And yeah. I mean, that's just the kind of stuff that. I mean, the whole happens. GCC is car crazy, right? Yes. So I think mm-hmm. as car and motorcycle people, there's just that instant connection. Yeah. Like yeah. I, every time I've been there, like I remember, oh man, I was probably seven or eight years ago and I spoke at the Dubai Travelers Festival. I think you remember that. Yeah. The people I met there were just like, just truthfully wonderful people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like the crown prince lent us a bus from his camel racing club. To, to, <laughs> to, to, to camel racing is a thing, man. I yeah, camel it's a real racing, deal. If, if yeah. it wasn't for COVID, I would have been there for sure, front row. Well, they had like those little, the yeah, little, little RC car guys and they like hit on their phones and it like, you know, like yeah. the little, the little RC man hits the camel gently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy <laughs> stuff. That's well, and, true. and for those that are listening, it's just so important as travelers that we are very, very careful about information about a country that comes from, from mainstream news, because that has, they have an agenda of driving traffic and viewership and uh, scary things sell yes. right in that yes. space. Absolutely. Definitely. And then we need to be even more careful about getting advice about travel from someone who has not been there. Absolutely. Um, in yes. fact, it should be dismissed out of hand because all you're doing is you're getting all of that scary news stuff now filtered through their own cognitive biases. And then now they're telling you all the reasons why you're going to die because you go to Ensenada, yeah. exactly. which is, which is of course completely false. So if, if we're looking to get information about traveling to a place, get a hold of someone who's been there recently and someone who's a traveler, not a business person that just happens to go to the cities, talk to somebody who's a traveler that loves travel that's been there recently and you're going to get all the great info you're going to find out where the great restaurants are the taxi guy who like totally hooked him up for the whole week and took him to see his family and those are the people you need to talk to if we drive our decisions off of what we see from media we'll be greatly misled yeah it was uh, our our friend austin vince there was a statement he had made that you you never listen to anyone who hasn't done exactly what you're planning to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless they've done exactly what you're planning, you know, set out to do. It's a lot of past like perpetuated misinformation. Sure. And it's unfortunate because so many great places are overlooked for people who maybe want to begin, you know, as a novice, begin traveling, begin seeing the world, and they start to trap themselves in these normal patterns of tourism because they don't, they're too scared to venture yeah. off and they keep listening to people who've only gone to Sands in right. Cancun. <laughs> yeah, you know? totally. well, I mean, Sonora, Sonora, Mexico is a great example of that. Uh, it's, no doubt. It's untouched. No you know, doubt. And I, I hate to tell people to go there because I want it to stay yeah, in touch, it's but it's, never go. it's, I mean, it really is an incredible place. And yeah. Equally, equally so to Baja in its own way and, and very different, very different than, than the rest of Mexico. And it is a border, you know, and it is a border state and you know, that comes with its own issues. Uh, yeah, you just have to be careful. Yeah. yeah. Just, just have to be mindful. Don't yeah. go looking don't for trouble. Don't be a trouble. target. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. ask for drugs in places. That's <laughs> yeah. number one. Yeah. Don't buy drugs in Tijuana. Yeah. 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 That's buy like, them in Ensenada. I always tell people, yeah. <laughs> quit trying to buy weed. When, you know, you just don't like quit doing that. That's yeah, how buy you a bottle of wine already. Just like, or they have this great thing called tequila. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That one little stretch of coast between Rocky Point, Puerto Penasco, yep. and El Golfo de Santa Clara. Yeah. Yep. Like no one, no, well, they do now because yeah. we're, yeah, we're yeah, just yeah. telling yeah. a couple, yeah. tens yeah. of thousands of people. But um, that, if you want to get away from the traffic of Baja coastline, um, that is a really neat spot. Absolutely. And cool. there's an easy road to get back to either city, but you can also drive along the coast and there's great camping. Yeah, El Golfo is a very cool. Yeah. It's scary. Don't go there. Don't steal yeah. my yeah. really beautiful, pristine <laughs> beach spots. Don't go to Hermosillo, <laughs> which is a really progressive and cool town. Yeah, that's another yeah, great yeah, spot. Hermosillo is very cool. They're very also, cool. Yeah, I mean, they're the Ensenada of Sonora. So they, yes. they've got the good food. They've got the, the youth that brings the art and brings the new cultures and brings the new ideas. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for, for where Mexico is going. I mean, I think the more you travel there, the more you start to see smaller houses turning into bigger houses, shacks turning into you yeah. know, developments. And maybe that wasn't the right way to say that, but there's progression, I guess. They're, yeah. And they're making a lot of stuff. Well, they, they make a lot of the way the United States was in the, you know, the twenties and thirties we were producing and, and Mexico's producing. Yeah. 
Yeah. They yeah. are. Well, and the internet yeah. allows this accessibility as a, an entrepreneur, as an artist, is putting yourself out there. And, you know, our generations and uh, Gen X, we've really grasped technology and, and made something mm-hmm. out of it. And Mexico is no different. So, yeah. You know, the rest of the world, as long as they have the internet, they can do something. Yeah. They can multiply themselves. Yes. Extend their audience very quickly. Yeah. I guess along that line, talk a little bit about what it is that you guys do. Like what's the, what is the the Rolodex of things that you guys do to make money to stay on the road? I mean, anything that someone will pay us for usually is a good start. (laughs) Okay. Let's, let's just stop there. (laughs) Um, This is going out on the internet. Um, (laughs) Well, I, I think on paper, we own a multimedia company and we create content for for the motorcycle industry, the motorsports industry, travel, travel. We, you know, we do photo editorial. We, we shoot video. We, I mean, we'll do PR. your book layout. We'll help you with your website. We'll give you consultation on PR, social media, marketing. I mean, anything that requires imagination in a sense for branding, we try to help with. Um, and I love and your branding stories. too. Like the, the West by 1000 logo is just so perfect. Great. Yeah. The so photography's great. great. The yeah, writing's that's, great. That's our buddy Asher. He, he told oh, yeah, he, he, he really was did. adamant on the fact that it needed to say nothing. Like a good, a good logo shouldn't say anything. Yeah. The Nike, that, the Nike swoosh, you know. Yeah, for sure. You, you know exactly what it is. And you guys have done big social media management campaigns for recognizable brands like Touratech comes to mind. Yep. Uh, what are some of the other clients that you Back, guys have worked with? Backcountry Discovery Routes, Wolfman Luggage. Butler, yeah. we still Butler, work Butler Maps. Yeah. yeah. Um, Black Dog. Black yeah, Kurt and Black Dog, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's speak, speaking of Baja. He's somebody who's... He is. He's, he's down living there. down there. Yeah, he's yeah. down there half the time. It's, and we actually just started working with Camel Adventure. Uh, which is, they're a really cool company. They've really broadened their horizons too since when we first met them and they were still Camel Tanks. Oh, and, cool. And they've been really expanding a lot on the product that they make. Yeah, and those tanks are great. Those are That's a great oh, way know. to add some range. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Very clever design. Very cool design, actually. I really like it. Yeah, we've done a lot, a lot with uh, in the motor, in the adventure motorcycle space in terms of social media management, yeah, marketing and that sort of thing. That's yeah. that's been, been the a most welcoming to us. So we just we like to go smaller, you know, like a few small projects at a time or clients at a time. Who yeah. to at least you know don't put all your eggs in one basket sort of thing. Yeah, they don't ask too much of us. We don't ask too much of them. We all stay pretty fluid. We've been doing a lot in the UTV space. Lately, yeah. Just it's. I mean, it's. It, it is what it is. Exploding, blowing up, exploding. Yeah. exploding. And I. It's exploding our trails, but yeah, that's yeah. a different. Dis- but I mean, to be honest, like I've, you know, I, I came into it. They were golf carts, as far as I was concerned, and powered by vacuums. And yeah. And uh, God, they sound so terrible. <laughs> so I. They're so depressing. If they can, ju- if they can just, fi- if they can just fix the sound. Oh, so I. That's well, all they, they got to do. They'll just have a stereo electric. that plays V8 noises while they're driving. Yeah, they just got to right. fix. All they got to do is fix the sound. I've, I've, I was in the one that fixed it. I, I was yes. just in the, the Yamaha 1000, I forget Iteration. the alpha numeric designation, you know, YZ, X, Y, R, whatever. Our, I did, we're doing a story about it. A friend took a, took the new Yamaha 1000. It's basically an R1 motor out of the, the motorcycle oh. with, a, with a big turbo. You've yeah. piqued my interest. Makes yeah. a hundred turbo. With a turbo. Makes, makes between 165 and 235 horsepower, depending on how much boost you're running through it. His iteration has, you know, he's, he's got a bunch of suspension work and stuff mm-hmm. done, but it sounds insane. It's, it has a sequential gearbox. So it's flappy paddles, wow. race car yeah. stuff. It's, he's got, and he put a skin on it that makes it look like a baby Raptor. Yeah. It's got, <laughs> it's got, it's got a fiber. I've brush. seen it with yeah. like the Volkswagens and they put like little, so yeah, he, little. uh, sequential gearbox. I, it's, he's got 25 inches of travel at the rear, 23 at the front. We rallied that thing yesterday on Sunday, I guess. I mean, it's, it's like a trophy truck. It's, it literally acts and feels like a trophy truck. Wow. It's nuts. Yeah. And want one so bad. Yeah. And that's the only first, it's the first one that I'm, I've been fully convinced to like, I need, I need something. Like Interesting. This in life. <laughs> he has some, some noises of it on his stories on Instagram. Cool, man. <laughs> just so in good. case you need a little taste. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so and good. where can we find you on Insta? Just my, my name. Justin, Justin W Coffee. And that's not coffee. It's coffee with a Y. Yeah. C O F F E Y. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it was that thing's amazing. And I I mean nice. I've been in the I've been in all of them now. The the new Can Am turbo, the Polaris, you know, big turbo stuff and that Yamaha is pretty wild. But. but but I still think that it it really is an issue with the noise. Oh, um, yeah. And it, and if they don't, if as an industry they don't take the thirteen year old petulance out of it, yeah, they're gonna lose the opportunity that's coming. Uh, just make them quiet because like it it's a big deal. Like yeah. people don't want them around their homes. Moab doesn't. Moab just canceled Rally in the Rocks because the town 
quite literally said, we don't want you in wow. effect. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they just need to make them quiet. Like everything else needs to be quiet and is supposed to be quiet because it's not just about you. Yeah. There's like other people trying to live around you. Stop being so selfish yeah. and make your thing quiet. Make it approachable. Yeah. More make beautiful. it quiet. Make it I'll, quiet. I'll take, yeah. a, I'll take a contrary point of view in this. Make them not sound terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, Less vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I don't really like hearing Harleys go by because they sound like, Scream, I don't know, like they, they sound like an internal me, combustion me, potato. Yeah. Um, but there are good engines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Make oh, it yeah. sound good. Yeah, make it sound good. Ranger just was launched. Yep. So earlier, you guys mentioned you lived in Japan. Yep. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's wild. Yes. Well, we were lucky because, again, it was one of those opportunities that just came and, and was placed on our laps. A friend of ours and his wife, she's in the military or in the Air Force, and they moved to Japan recently at the time. This was like late 2014. Yeah. They had a nice big house on the Yakota Air Force Base and said, hey, anytime you want, come out, hang out for however however long you want. Mistake on their part because we were there for like five, six months. Longer but- than that. I've made that mistake with travelers. <laughs> yeah. Come for Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you kick yeah. them out on well, he- New Year's. He, he was a friend of mine who he was trying to be a filmmaker and he was, he had met this group of motorcyclists, um, expat motorcyclists that were exploring abandoned towns, villages. They're called Haikyos. Yeah, they're called uh, or yeah. Different. Fasc- yeah. fascinating stuff. Well, it's and the most ex- most of that you can only get to on a motor. A lot of it you can only get to on a motorcycle or it's, it's much easier, car. you know, either on foot or on a, on a dual sport of some kind. And so he wanted to film something about that and wanted us to come along. And so we did create some content for, for that. And we ended up there a lot longer. We got lucky. The, the um, security force commander for the Dakota air base was his neighbor and, and good friend and a good friend. And so normally you're, you know, after 30 days, you got to take a hike, Sure, but he just would sign us in for another Every 30, 30 days. days. Yeah, and so great. he, uh, he's retired now, so I don't think he can get in trouble for that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a pretty, a pretty minor thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. So yeah, we ended up there a lot longer than we anticipated and did a lot of cool stuff traveled from there to the philippines and and when we went to sardinia we were coming from japan yeah yeah Yeah. came back to the states once i believe at least once i went back to the states for the turtec rally actually but yeah i mean we spent pretty much all of our time there riding riding motorcycles or surfing it was we'd surf like we did actually do a lot of surfing surf like three days a week and then whoa and then ride our, these dual sports around. We ended up. I mean, they have some really great waves, especially because we like long boards. I'm still just, I paddle around and then I paddle after something and then I, it misses me. And then he surfs though. <laughs> and it's just like, it's a bigger culture than we expected. And there's this like huge Americana motorcycle culture that oh, we yeah. didn't ex- yeah. expect either. And yeah. Moon Eyes has a show there, like a big vintage chopper wow. show. It's a big, oh, yeah. big deal. Big stuff. They wear the- Did you guys see those like the rad, like 90s or 80s scooters that were like super crazy? Or maybe oh, that Bo was Suzoku. Bo Suzoku. Yeah. Yes. There's Plenty. A, I, yeah. I love Japan. Japan love actually Japan. scares me more than Saudi Arabia, though, because <laughs> nothing is sized appropriately for me at 6'3". <laughs> <Yeah. three. laughs> Everything's going to cause you some kind of I, physical I, yeah. I, I once, I once <laughs> yeah. was at like a udon noodle restaurant, and I stood up, and the chair went with me, and <laughs> and and then the chair fell over, and I'm pretty sure I offended someone's grandmother <laughs> 14 times because the restaurant, like, Dead completely silent. hushed. Yeah. Stopped. Yes. Yeah. That is an interesting thing about their culture that I actually felt more aware of myself in Japan because they have such strict cultural regulations for themselves. Like, yeah. which is actually why we got away with so much because they think gaijins are dumb yeah. and we're just animals. So, you know, if they, we would go exploring around the mountains, let's say there's like this closed down mine, they put a sheet that says, please don't go in here. And no one from the country will go in there except for expats. Yeah. And they see it and they're like, oh, they just lift the sheet and go through. <laughs> yeah, in the U.S. it'd be gated, you know, there'd be electric fence and yeah, you know, sure. danger. You're going to die and get sued and all that. And they're yeah. like, literally just like a tarp. Like, please don't go in here. And they're like, okay, yeah, we won't go in there. And yeah. you know, we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah. What's behind the What's curtain? What's behind the curtain? <laughs> it's, yeah. We got to go it's in there. built into our <laughs> yeah. And they kind of forgive us for like anything that we do because they're just like, well, you guys don't know any better. It's okay. <laughs> but they're wonderful people. I think it's, oh, it's one of the few places I've traveled where people will actively come up to you and ask if you need help. Totally. Yeah, of course. Like, I don't yeah, know how beautiful. many times I've been on like, you know, a, a, a subway 
a Kyoto or Osaka or something. And I'm just like, help. Which by the way, is the most confusing thing to I've, navigate. I've kind of figured out <laughs> Tokyo, but then I haven't, like, I don't know how it works. I don't, well, I you think, think that, Tokyo is hard because you have to catch so many networks of trains. Yeah. Yes. It's and they're crazy. happening. Like, right. it's not like it's the one train that's coming in 15 minutes. It's the one train that's coming in 15 seconds. Yeah. You've got to, and you have to be right on top yeah. of it. And they are super helpful. And I remember the first time I got on a train, I came on with an elderly man. Three or four young people stood up immediately to yes. offer him. That's what you're supposed to do. I still yeah. have my I think mom in my background. Like, like I'm, I'm afraid she's going to come out somewhere Whack. and smack yeah. me yeah. because yeah. If, if I don't get up. Yeah. Yeah, and you should. And But it's beautiful that that is still part of their culture, that they, they have such respect for the elderly. And because of that, the, the elderly live much longer. Mm-hmm. Yep. They have much healthier lives for that longer period of time. They're much more engaged with the family. They're revered. Yeah. They're, um, you know, they're still intellectually challenged because their family comes to them with questions and engagement. Um, and I think that that's a really beautiful thing. So my yeah. family's Filipino. They have a similar value. Nice. Yeah. Maybe not as strict as <laughs> Japan's, but it's, it's that like you take care of your own for as long as possible. Yeah. And you come together and it's just, it's not necessarily that it's an obligation. Yes. Maybe on paper it's an obligation, but it's like, it's, an honor to be able to get to know those people as long as possible. And they have so much wisdom. They've, they've like made all of those stupid mistakes. Absolutely. If like, if we would yeah. talk to our elders a little more, we probably would have less suffering yeah. in the yeah. world. If we just asked them a couple of questions, they'd be like, Oh, I remember in 1965, I did that thing. And mm. yeah, that was not such a good you know program. So yep. yeah, I think that's really a beautiful part of Japan and, and how clean everything is. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. and, oh, I love that. Yeah. Clean that's bathrooms. My favorite. Yeah. Mm. Clean bathrooms and and the food is actually super super great it's expensive but yes although you can eat at 7-eleven yeah you know and what you can eat really well see that we survived off of 7-eleven yeah. for the most part truck stops fantastic is that how you guys did oh, that yeah. because i yeah. found that that tokyo and nagoya was like oslo level prices prices yeah, yeah we were so what was your tricks around that 7-eleven literally 7-eleven has like insane it's not food. like a 7-eleven you'd see yeah it's nothing anywhere like else US. you know it's especially in the countryside yeah. you've got a lot of truck stops you've got a lot of it's because their weekends are like it's weekend let's go out to the country and oh, jam-packed freeways so the truck stops and 7-eleven type places they have high quality food like i literally mm-hmm. got octopus and soybean salad at 7-Eleven. We had, they changed bows their kind of sushi yeah, bows, stuff. things like that. In October, it's it's like a squid month. So everything <laughs> is dyed black and yeah. it's, oh, rice pucks. Oh, rice pucks. Yeah, I mean, you can live on rice pucks. I mean, we were, tra- we were traveling on bikes. So triangle like, things? Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, you, you told me about those things and yeah. I went to a 7-Eleven and I ate them and they were bad even when I was drunk. <laughs> Yeah, you may have gotten the wrong. I mean, you have to find the one with the right picture. He's allergic to most fish, so he had to find the one that said chicken or like plum. I had or the one with tuna, and it was like eating cat food with bad rice <laughs> mixed with seaweed. They have you one gotta, that has baby eels in, in this in the center, and that's that's it. a fun surprise when, like, <laughs> yeah. when you're not trying to buy the one with baby I, I, eels I, and you bite I have into to it. Say, you're like, Whoa. My, my experience in Japan has has been that the food really wasn't that expensive. But maybe we were. I mean, I, like I've had very expensive meals there. Like if you try and go for proper sushi, it yeah. is. Um, yeah, it was expensive. Oh, yeah, it's really, yeah. really yeah. expensive. But you can you can have any meal you want for $7 yeah. American, roughly. I yeah. mean, if you're eating where, um, you know, kind of maybe where people do for lunch or, or whatnot. Um, they like, got lucky because, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, they, they like soft serve. And oh, God. Kira loves yes. soft serve. So there's, <laughs> that What's that yes. soft serve that's at Narita Airport that's basically butter? Oh, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like even, yeah. so their vanilla it's, is not vanilla. It's like, um, it's milk. Yeah, it's like, like a milk. That's, oh. milk that's the flavor they call it. Wow. So it's like really rich stuff. and thick. And that was like my main goal at any truck stop <laughs> was yeah. to get ice cream <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> I still look for it everywhere I go, but... Oh, that's amazing. Now, so at the end, now, how long were you in Japan total? Well, it was over the course of nine months, and but we were gone. We were in the Philippines, I think, for like a month during that. Okay. And then we were in Italy for a few weeks, or in Sardinia. And then I went back to the States for a few weeks. And, and didn't you guys have Ducatis in the Philippines? Uh, we had a, K- a KTM yeah. Duke 390. I remember that. Yes. And this weird 200cc Kawasaki that I've never seen before. The front end was not so... Yeah, the head bolt was but loose. I and rode it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's and then out. where, where in the Philippines were you guys? That particular time we were in... Oh, well, we're... Palawan. Um, we ended up Palauan, in Palawan. Yeah. And then we were also in Davao, Mindanao. Yeah, Mindanao. 
Yeah. I have family like in Luzon and Mindanao and and a little bit of Cebu. So we just kind of hung around them and then we went to Palawan because that's like that's like the locals vacation mm. retreat. Mm. There's um Boracay, which is like the traveler's retreat. Palawans don't go there. It's terrible. Never yeah. go. But it's like that's the local place. Well, El, El Nido's on the north end of Palawan and that's kind of touristy gringo stuff, but the rest of that that island is pretty undeveloped and that amazing. sounds amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah, like we mangrove found, forests and like literally the what could be defined as paradise is actually out a boat ride outside of El Nido. And thankfully I don't remember the name, so I won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is supported in part by Red Ox Manufacturing. Since 1980 Red Ox Manufacturing has been handcrafting the toughest soft-sided travel luggage in the world. Founded and operated by second-generation United States veterans, Red Ox bags are backed by the industry's finest warranty, the Noble Lifetime Warranty. You break it, we'll wonder how, but then we'll repair it or replace it, no questions asked. Designed and lovingly built with pride in Billings, Montana, using 99% American source materials, Red Ox bags are unique and innovative and tough as tanks. It's well, describe what paradise was. Oh, like, what what about it made it paradise? I mean, well, one, you, there's no way in. So it's on a peninsula, but the peninsula is so thick with jungle, there's no roadways. Okay. So you have to boat. And, you know, this the typical, like, semi-shallow to a shelf in the water, everything's crystal blue. So you can scuba. You, they have mm. kayak rentals. The place that we went is like a co- uh, like five cottage resort run by a family. So can't have a lot of people there. Mm. So the beach is really secluded. Um, and it's built into like a a mangrove. So it's essentially like a giant tree that kind of blocks this boardwalk in the trees that you can walk through. It's not expensive, all things considered. The family feeds you every day. We'll be sure to not put that in the show notes and selfishly go there ourselves. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) They have a little like (laughs) bar shack that's like right on the ocean and the guy that son who runs the joint, basically he comes down there and just like makes you rum and cokes. Yeah. You just tell him an email, like what you want to drink when you're there. And he's like, cool. I'll just run to the store. You know, when we <laughs> go and do a trip to El Nino, grab groceries and come back. Amazing. Yeah, and fantastic. how long did you guys stay there? I think like a week. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. It was great. That sounds yeah, so we went, perfect. We went with her mom and her sister and her nephew and we just, it was basically us and then like an English couple and we just hung out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they switched out for, Another couple that didn't really care yeah. to be around us too, so it worked out perfect. great. That sounds so perfect. That sounds so perfect. Yeah, yeah we've, we were just in the Philippines. That was this. That, yeah. We found that place the last time we were in the Philippines, but had we known, we'd always go there. Where, where else in your travels have you had that same sense of it being paradise? Is there anything else that comes to mind? <laughs> There's a there's a little hotel right in the center center of the Baja Peninsula that has a has a little like a little bar in the middle of it and the bar has like a really really terrible old pool table. Baja folks will know it's Catavina. It's, oh, yeah, yeah, it's in it's in Catavina and it's it's an oasis. I mean you, yeah. you you come in there and it's like it looks like something out of bedrock. Like, it's yeah, really cool. It's I incredible. It. And it, that area actually kind of looks like Prescott with all the decomposing yes. granite boulders yes. and, yeah. and yep. that kind of stuff. Or like 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 east of San Diego, like El Cajon, that area yep. where they're just yeah. all that stuff. And you, there's nothing there. There's not even a gas. I think they've been. Is that new Pemex station finished? Allegedly. Yes. Okay. Alleg- okay. Allegedly. I, it, it, it was is. the last time we were okay. there. Last time I was there, yeah. it was working. It was yeah. working. So that prior to that, it was, it made it even better that there was no gas station. It was yeah, just an old lady with gas cans. And Yep. But that, that bar, we, we always talk about that bar being like the, like the cantina in Mos Eisley in Star Wars. Like yeah. the only people there are travelers. No one lives, I mean, no one lives in the town. Even Not like really. even, even Danny who runs the bar there, he lives 45 minutes away. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's hardly anyone that lives there and it's all travelers. And any given day that you're there, you'll meet who like, you never know what you're going to run you, into. You, you know what kind of place it is by the stickers that are around. Yeah. 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 Stickers. Yeah. And you, and you like, you end up blotto off of giant margaritas shooting yeah, pool with like travel. truck drivers. And it's just this, it has a very different sort of appeal than <laughs> like, a, like a pristine beach. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but it it's, sounds I mean, perfect. It's, people like that stuff. Yeah. yeah it sounds I mean, it's like when you're, when you're on a dirt bike trip and you just want to go like sit by the pool. And I and love like the courtyards on that hotel too, oh, yeah. where, where the rooms kind of face in. Yep. And yeah. It's yeah, great. Very I love Spanish that. Villa sort I love of that. Style. Yes. Have you guys done the uh, mission Santa Maria just oh, out yeah. of Catavina? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You did that on dirt bikes? We yeah. actually... 
it, the last time we were there was just this December, and we went with our friend Jaffe. We had done like a little off road trip from Ensenada down, and mm-hmm. then always to close off the day in San Quintin is we just go do a sunset ride on the beach, yeah. and just like go fifteen miles one way, fifteen miles the other way, <laughs> and then just like laugh and smile the whole time, take Instagram videos. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, just buy like beach trips in Baja on our on dual sports. We were the tide the tide had just run out, so that the beach was like. Like look like glass. Like wow. you're just running across glass was super good. Yeah. I can't go wrong with that. That's pretty good stuff too. Any other spots that come across your mind as those moments of paradise? It depends on your definition of paradise, right? Well, I'm but interested in yours. <laughs> like, so far it's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So far I'm good with it. Like I'd say if if you're more of a like a city dweller, Verona is one of my favorite places to mm. go. Like I base it off of where would we live? You know, mm. where would we be willing to stay for a long period of time, even if they're not really conducive to that? But um, Verona's a, it's an ancient town. It was where the, what do you call that? The, the, Col- the Colosseum, Colosseum in Verona is the, is the Colosseum. It was built before the Colosseum in Rome. And, and it was wow. the inspiration for was, the one yeah. in Rome. So it looks, it's like a, just a smaller version. Yeah. And they're just, the, the old town is night closed off by a, a river and it's really beautiful. The town's very livable. It's very quiet, but it has a lot of history. And of course, Italian things, food, yeah. culture. I heard the food's wine. bad there. It's they have awful. bad wine. The cars yeah. are yeah. really ugly. Never go. Super expensive. It's also <laughs> 20 minutes from the dopest go-kart oh track my God. on earth. <laughs> yes. It's an indoor, outdoor, two, two level gas powered go-kart what? track. And yeah. it has a one, it's a two minute lap. Two, it's got That's like pretty long. It's yes. a, yeah. And it yeah. has a like a Mario Kart style like spiral, spiral like corkscrew, corkscrew yeah, coming corkscrew down from down. the top level, <laughs> and actually, you're just sideways the whole way down the thing. That's amazing. It's, it's <laughs> actually, there's a, a few Italian. Um, I miss a Formula One racers who go in and they just like they ham it up there. Yeah, just hang out. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bar that like that faces the track. It. So when you're done, you can just knock out some cold beers. And or if you're Italian when you're not done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our friend Manny Lucchese took us there a number of years ago for the first time. And every time we're in Verona to hang out with him, we have to go there. And yeah. no one can beat him. He's the fastest he's dude. He's the slowest around. man on the road. And he's like, run Dakar a few times too. Uh, Malimoto. Yeah. Malimoto, yeah. 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 yeah, and his goal was to just just like crush Malay Moto all the time and then become a water boy for one of the, the oh, teams. Yeah. yeah. But, and he's extremely talented and like a very interesting person. Mm. I mean, he's the only person you should ever interview. Oh, but, interesting. But he is also the slowest person on the road. Like he drives a, well, at last time we saw him, he had a big van and he's, you know, 10, 10 miles below the speed limit at, at any given time. And he's yeah. like, I don't want tickets, you know, come on. Well, but then did. you get him in a go-kart track on a dirt bike and he's, he's like ballistic yeah. nuts. Like, any other opportunity. I mean, he's the fastest guy in most circles. Wow. Awesome. That's, that's very cool. Run is a good, run is a good town. Well, right there's, I mean, yeah, there's plenty of places. Right? That's the problem. Is It's a big world. Yeah. When yeah. we were talking earlier about like, what did you learn about your travels? You know, now as a, tra- a consistent traveler it's that one there are too many wonderful places so you just gotta like figure out what it is you need and find the place that suits that because every place yeah. is fantastic yeah but we've also learned that toilets are amazing <laughs> incredible invention like when you spend when you spend a bunch of time oh, in, in a country that doesn't yeah. have them squat toilets or yeah. just has squat toilets or has yeah. nothing. amazing invention yeah. you know it has not. i thought squat toilets were the worst until i went to northern china and mongolia and then apparently cement hole in the ground is worse yeah in there yeah. sucks yeah it's, it's, i know i just rather go outside i really appreciate a flushing toilet now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's something you just uh, you know yeah. it's hard to and on that bomb show <laughs> <laughs> well what do you guys have coming up next now that things are starting to open up what are your big plans for the next year or so yeah you're doing that the new build yeah yes. bike we got a royal enfield int 650 we're gonna build a scrambler out yes. of that thing fun yeah, that one's coming along. That was probably the bike that we had because they were going to take it down to Phoenix to give it to somebody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that yeah. might be us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's only Does it every once in a while not start? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a royal yeah, no, field. No, it's like every once in a while the starter button doesn't work. Yeah, yeah it's no, probably that's, the same that's bike. that's it. And then <laughs> sometimes the, the, the gas gauge is like, you're full. And then yeah. it's like, well. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> hey, for for the price tag. Oh, it's it's, it's such, such a great bike. It's such a great bike. Yeah. We have the Sonora Rally in May. That they, they moved the dates. It would have been in April. Now it's in May. Yeah, or no, it would have been in March, sorry. Okay. And they moved that to May. We're going to Baja in a week. We'll be there for until we don't feel like being there. And then we're like trying to develop some 
top secret routes, which probably everyone know about with our friend who has a tour company out there and trying to do some ADV stuff. Nice. Do some whatever. He's going to walk across Baja. So he asked if we wanted to do that. So mm. we'll see. Um, so so our rally May and then end of June, we go to uh, Russia for the oh, Silkway. Oh, for the Silkway. So they're, then, they're, what I do know is that they're starting in Southern Russia, actually, well, South East, southwestern Russia this year. Last year, which it, side of the Urals are they going to start? I, I can't remember the name of the town. Last year, we were in Irkutsk, yeah, sure. in yeah. southern Siberia, and we yeah, went sure. from Irkutsk just we, straight down. Like we went around Lake Baikal, and then we came down. And went, yeah, Baikal is great. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It's we, a yeah. fantastic. They actually, the Silkway does a really good job about like showing their media, the culture, and and yeah. the good time because we got. All a big taste of that. Yeah. I guess after that, we're still not like 100% confirmed, but there's uh, an event called Mongolia Monkey Run. It's one of many things that are put on by the adventurists. Oh, yeah. yeah. The adventurists. Yeah. And so that's a pretty fun group. They're yeah, they, super fun. Yeah, they want us to come and ride these 50cc monkeys across I saw, Mongolia. I saw it. Yes. I saw the advertisement. <laughs> that is that is the, the the last thing that I would like to do. I would yeah, kill no, to see you on might. a 50cc monkey. Oh God, like, I don't like know it. if my arms would go down far enough to like even touch the handlebars. I think you so. would just walk with it. Like, you just throttle <laughs> yeah. and then it moves and you move. The, the, kind the of problem is that my spine would be the suspension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's the deal. Yeah. That's well, and then deal. when it floods in Mongolia... Pretty much your bike disappears. Can yeah. I just put it on a small backpack? Yeah, I mean, you'd yeah, probably, you'd probably yeah. be better off. And yeah. I, I know some people did one of their monkey bike adventures in, it was in Morocco. Yeah. Oh, that, yes. And they said it was lovely. Yes. Yeah. I want to go. I would not think it was lovely. <laughs> yeah. No, maybe not for you. You know, I think it's it's the fact that they do something so ridiculous that it gives you permission to do something yes. so ridiculous. Yeah. 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 And like, that, I, that I part totally of it, understand. that part of it, I like. I just want to do the ridiculous thing. On a bigger bike? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they had a, a rickshaw one. On a KTM 950. Yeah. 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 I think it was like, I don't know if it was Hong Kong or part of China, and they had like a race on rickshaws. Yeah. I was like, that sounds dope, except yeah. it sucks for the guy who's pulling you in a rickshaw. Oh, the, rick- <laughs> the, the, the rickshaw run they did, yeah, it was in India. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. See, I would do that. Yeah. Because at least then I'm sitting down. And again, <laughs> spine Well, and then isn't... someone else is doing all the running part. Well, no, they have, they have little motors. Yeah, it's got the little... Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's like it's the kind of like the... Yeah, the trikes. Yeah, they kind of bolt, uh, <laughs> yeah, like a cabin on the back of a, mo- of yeah. a 125cc yeah. motorcycle. Yeah, I was exactly. thinking old traditional, I think like, the last... carried by yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. powered <laughs> that, that would be cool for about 100 yeah, like meters. 100, yeah. <laughs> yeah like t- no one yeah. would yeah. enjoy it. <laughs> no. I think the monkey thing is in August, and then we... And yeah, Mongolia is great. It's yeah. it's yeah, that that it. northern route was one of the most memorable special routes that I've ever done coming in from Russia yeah. in the northwestern part of Mongolia and then running across the whole northern it's such northern an steeps. Country. Yeah, that it's was unbelievable. Yeah, it is an amazing place. I mean, like talking about going to, from Saudi Arabia where things seem really untouched, they're also a, nom- a nomadic country, so it's like if you go to Mongolia, the landscape you see is virgin territory, yeah. you know, nobody is built on it and it looks like what it did thousands and thousands of years ago so it's, yeah, and, if, and when they and when they in. move with their livestock they 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 pick up their gur and yep. within a few months it's all green grass under yeah. the gur again they've not like laid concrete or dug some giant hole it literally just goes away yep. yeah it's wonderful. Like it, like it's it really beautiful happen. yeah it's, yeah, it's beautiful actually 10 years ago if you'd have told me that i've been to mongolia three times i never would have wow you know it's like i never would have thought that would happen in my life i, I didn't not that i didn't want to go i just didn't know it's you know those those sorts of things just when they well there's so many countries in the world to see yeah, yeah. yeah especially when you don't know anyone who's been to some of these it was yeah. kind of like the conversation earlier how do you know what to expect or yeah. what to want to go to if, if i was to ask you guys uh, and maybe you can both answer in your own way but for those that are listening that are they're, they're hearing your story and your life genuinely sounds fantastical, not only to me, and it's because you guys have made decisions to live your life a different way. What kind of advice would you give to someone who maybe wanted to start from the place that you did at point A? Uh, what kind of advice would you give them to get started just to give them some encouragement, whatever that might be? I'm like, I'm so... I'm, I'm, I'm a so bit of a f- fatalist. So I usually, you know, like, you're not going to live as long as you think you are. Yeah. You're probably going to live a lot. You're probably going to die a lot sooner than you think. And yeah. you should get to it because it's just, there's too many opportunities for bad things to happen. Being stagnant and sitting yeah. around and doing nothing. I just... 
my, my, my father's nightmare is to die on the toilet. Yeah, so. sure. <laughs> Yeah. He, he kind of imparted that on me and I just, you know, it's like, you got to just go, go do it. Say yes. Try, you know, get after it and be willing to give up a lot. I yeah. mean, yeah. We, she, well, and that was part of it. It's like, if you just, if you wait until you have all the gear and the right things to be able to go, you'll never go. So just yeah. get the thing you can afford, pick a place and go for it because it's not going to be the last place you go, especially yeah. once you decide to do that. So pick one place that's approachable, something that you can afford, yeah. go to it and then build your way up to the next place yeah i think having like having your sights set on stuff really helps motivate yeah you know if you just buy the plane ticket don't don't worry about the hotel or how you're gonna get there or what you're gonna do when you're there just buy a plane ticket get that moving and then yeah. or yeah. And marry rich or just prepare <laughs> to be poor a lot. like we don't you know we have a lot of we're rich with experiences but we definitely our money when we're traveling a lot it just we dedicate what money goes into there and yeah. we expect to spend it and we don't cry if we spend it or overspend yeah. because it's, it's part That's of what, what you, happened. And, and you I think, set it up. I think that you guys have done a, a really good job. You haven't emphasized the vehicle too much. Like you're, you're not, we haven't even talked about it really. Yeah. I mean, podcast, yeah. like you guys are about the travel and, and I think, you know, I know like a while ago for me, I just, I just went like, okay, go to Vietnam and rent a scooter. Like you yeah. don't, you don't have to like save up to buy the GS nope. to buy the, the right $2,000 jacket to buy the panniers and this and this and this i think what's inspirational to me about you guys is you just went and you just did yeah. it and you you found adventures that that you could do at the time with what you had with what fit into your schedule and you like you said you, you just didn't say no yeah. um and i think some i think overland travelers man how do you say it like they they get a little bit too tied up with the vehicle sometimes and maybe that's because it's part of the passion yeah you know? it's, yeah. it is totally exciting for sure. yes yeah. Yeah. but not everybody not everybody it, but it's expensive, I oh, guess, yeah. is what I'm trying it's, to get at, yeah, right? It's, it's expensive to get tied up with the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you just think more as a traveler and less as a enthusiast of a particular motorcycle. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, we know a lot of folks who, you know, they're building out vans and four by four. And my father's a great example. You know, he's he's got this bitchin' four-wheel drive Quigley van on 35s and but he's always he's always wanting to do more to it instead of just use do it something just go, just go do, yeah. like yeah. Dude, the van's fine it's got a bed built into the back it's yeah. got a fresh motor like off you go man. yeah if yeah. you look inside our van it's funny because we you know for a little while we were known for this like van life sort of thing because we just before it was cool and before then it became it too life. mainstream for west by one time <laughs> and then, and then well, i wrote a i wrote a piece for for expedition portal yeah. about the realities of it and yeah. the idea well, and that having a, it is like once you quit once you quit moving you're just you're homeless, homeless living in a van <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is, so ours, if you open ours up, it's like it was never visually stimulating for people who like gear and, and building things up because it's literally just got like it's a, a cargo van. Yeah, yeah, it's a cargo van. It looks like you're inside of a big potato. And then, <laughs> I mean, we didn't get foam for the what do you call that? The plywood bed platform thing that we have for like four years. We just slept on deflating mattresses. <laughs> for a while <laughs> and, and you guys have been to paradise because of that and that's the difference yeah. is that you guys have made a decision for those experiences to be a priority it's interesting thinking about what you said justin around life being short i think also one thing that i've recognized is that the world is nowhere near as dangerous as we're programmed to think that it is i mean two thousand years ago the world was extremely dangerous and we still have that genetic makeup where we're we're constantly pessimistic about our prospects of survival surviving to tomorrow. <clears throat> the reality is, is that the world now is very safe and you have to work really hard to actually make it unsafe. Yeah. You got to go um, looking for the trouble. You have to really go looking for the trouble. So if we can just for a moment recalibrate our mind to realize that to your point, Kira, like if it doesn't work out, you just pivot a little bit, you change your plan. Maybe you go someplace else. Maybe you come back and work for a while to make some more money. The consequences of starvation really aren't yeah. a thing yeah, anymore. <laughs> Yeah, you'll <laughs> eat or you'll be able to find medical care. Something will will work out because the world is a lot safer place now. Uh, that's really interesting that you say that. And it's been certainly on my mind, too. So yeah. we can't thank you too enough for being on the podcast yeah, and thank for, you for sharing you. sharing your experiences. Do you have any more questions for them? Yeah. When are we going to go drink beer? <laughs> you're, I think you're already, you're not already drinking beer. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking, drinking fizzy water. I'm drinking fizzy water. <laughs> Although I think the last time I saw you, 
We were very drunk at Dirty Dicks in Paris. In Paris, oh, yes. drinking tiki oh, drinks. We I mean, I don't know if this indeed. story is appropriate for it, but we went back there and Justin had a wild time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just remember walking in and you like handed me this drink that was on fire. Yeah. It yeah. was yeah. on fire. It's like, okay, for those who don't know what we're talking about, Dirty Dicks is like this epic tiki hole bar. in the wall tiki bar in the middle in Paris. of Paris. Yeah, it's incredible. And then it's across the street from like a divey, scary Russian night dance bar um, <laughs> where Justin accidentally almost maybe got drugged and then uh, turned into a Russian prostitute. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Yeah. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. I was, I was still inebriated at 4 PM the following day. Oh, yeah. He had to have me sing him to sleep. That is not a thing we do. Yeah. <laughs> I was, it was not good. I had my stepfather had to rescue me. I, yeah. Ooh, and man. then they still were like, oh, yeah, should we stop for yeah, beer? They were there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we grabbed beers on the way back. And then what yeah. was that little cafe that we went to that was owned by your friends? Oh, uh, they clo- yeah, they closed, closed that place. It was right by Garden Nord, right by the train yeah, yeah, station. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, yeah, they, that was perfect. I wish that there was it was a sustainable thing because it was yeah. just not the walking traffic. It's yeah. a great place. Anyway. Well, that's a great yeah. story. Well, and another so. segue into Paradise Found in Absolutely. remote yeah. places. Oh, yeah, exactly. And Russian bars in downtown Paris. Yeah, don't do that. Just say no. Don't do it. Well, thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time.